Um, hello, everyone. So what's the real bottleneck when we're trying to you know, move forward and achieve for tolerant quantum computing? Many people will point to qubit coherence, gate fidelities, or the well-known I.O. challenge. But once you achieve very good average you know, high fidelities across your quantum computing platform, the challenge actually shifts. Because at this point, the quantum control stack will determine if you can move forward to quantum error correction and logical operations at scale. So I'm Michaela Eichinger, a physicist working at the, in the product team of quantum machines. And today I want to walk you through a hybrid new architecture that will bring us into this new stage of quantum computing. But first, I want to start out with you know, looking at where we are at today. So here you can see on the left a sketch of what the typical you know, um, architecture of a solid state based quantum computer looks like. You have a dilution refrigerator with the quantum processor that sits at the bottom. And then the control unit um, that sits at the center will send the pulses to do the quantum operations and perform readout. And then this controller communicates with the host, so your laptop or your lab computer. And this, yeah, so um, probably many of you are familiar with the nice picture here on the right that shows Google Quantum's AI processor. So you see the nice wiring in the back, the, the, back, um, the control hardware that they're using. These architecture or this stack brought us you know, very far. We're seeing the first you know, pre for tolerant experiments, seeing error correction below threshold, and the first lattice surgery um, experiments as well. However, um, this stack um, has you know, constraints, and it's not sufficient really to, to move us to the next stage. So why am I saying that? Because um, there are specific you know, requirements that we, can, we have for photolerant quantum computing. And of course, on one hand, we, have, um, you know, we need to achieve very low physical error rates, so very high fidelity single and two qubit gates, as well as very fast and accurate state readout. Then when this is basically in place um, or you know, halfway there, we, we can already try doing all of these error de detection and correction experiments. However, it becomes very clear, especially with the latest experiments that we're seeing um, in this area, that it's not just enough to do post-processing, but for photolerant quantum computing, we need to be able to do in a very dynamic manner, mid-circuit measurements and, and branching um, during during the execution of these error correction schemes. On the way to quantum error correction, however, there is another big bottleneck, and I think we've been hearing you know, many talks addressing this issue, and this is you know, calibration and tune-up. How do we you know, tune up these systems and really you know, are able to just really move on and focus on the logical operations? And right now, if we look at how you know, quantum systems are operated, you have a very you know, offline or static manner of qubit calibrations, meaning you, do, you calibrate your system maybe in the morning or every few hours. However, it's not really interlaced with your quantum job that you're running. Then actually, when you look at the drift that these systems have, which are typically in the milliseconds to, to minute timescales, you want to be able to have a very fast and adaptive calibration um, technique um, that is automated and um, allows you to execute it intra-job. So all of these requirements actually um, lead to needing a lot of classical compute. Um, so anything from optimization, calibration, decoding, um, um, puts a heavy load on these classical resources that are needed to perform the actual quantum operation. And on top of that, it also needs to be extremely tightly integrated with the quantum part. Um, and that is what I'm referring here to under, as under strict latency constraints. So let's look at this a bit more in detail, because if we now evaluate our architecture again, we can see that actually um, between the controller and QPU interface, things are looking you know, very nice um, with regards to quantum error correction because already now with controllers like the OPX1000, so controllers that we at Quantum Machines build, you're able to have very fast feedback times um, under 160 nanoseconds, meaning in a very ultra low latency manner, you are able to update and parameters of your repulse sequences of your quantum circuits. However, if we look at the top layer of the stack, we're seeing that the communication between the controller and the host is actually in the millisecond range, 
because typically we connect our controller with an Ethernet cable um, yeah, to, to, to the lab computers. And um, this is insufficient for real-time um, quantum error correction, and we're seeing that you know, from research in the field that, that much faster communication is required. And at Quantum Machines, we also did our own research to actually derive how fast we need to be for this top layer. So um, this is work that was led by Yanis Kurman. And a few years ago, we tried to go out there and see what are the actual requirements for all of these different layers in the stack and how fast do these different layers need to communicate. And we did not find a lot of information. So we actually went and took a specific example, in this case, Shor's algorithm, um, and factorizing the number 21 and really try to go from the logical layer down to the circuit, surface code layer and breaking it down into the smallest bits to derive the hardware requirements that we have. And, and based on this, we extracted that um, on the decoder front, so the decoder handles you know, the, the measurement data that comes from your quantum error correction you know, implementation, and you want to be able to decode you know, the errors um, within um, 10 to 20 microseconds. So the decoder needs to be very fast. It needs to handle a lot of classical compute. But then this decoder also needs to send information in a very fast manner back to the controller so that it can update the control sequence. And we defined here a latency, um, a threshold of around 10 microseconds. So you see already that you know, right now the state of the art architecture gives you milliseconds time scales. But however, our research shows us that we need you know, something that is you know, in the microsecond range. So with this in mind, we went out there and actually um, went on to build a reference architecture. And we did this in collaboration with um, NVIDIA, um, which is also known under the name of DGX Quantum. So now we're taking our um, OPX uh, 1000 controller and connect it to a Grayshopper superchip, which has a CPU and a GPU instance. And then we also um, use a new hardware link called the OPNIC, which is an optical interface that now allows us to have um, round trip latencies and communication between these two um, components of under four microseconds. So we now have a, a, the first integrated CPU, GPU, um, and we call it HPU, which refers to the hybrid processing unit that is part of the OPX. And this now allows you to really, you know, you open a whole new realm on how to think about quantum error correction and calibration. And of course, you know, hardware is only so good as the software that runs on top. So um, this can be all, you know, program from like a single software interface where you use QA, which is quantum machines programming language for your quantum operations and real-time processing in the hardware. But now you also combine it with you know, the, the unique and large library of CUDA and CUDA quantum um, on the classical um, resource side. So I wanna come back to calibration because on our way to quantum error correction, um, calibration and stability are not optional. And as I mentioned before, we have lots of system drifts, you know, qubits drift in frequency, amplitude, phase, and on time scales that, that can vary depending on the, the hardware system that you're working on. And um, we're seeing here also, so DGX is actually, DGX Quantum is opening a whole new paradigm on how we can now bring AI and machine learning tools into this field of um, quantum computing. Um, and in addition, because we cut down so much on the communication times, you really can start thinking about how to interlace calibration with an actual quantum job. And while we're moving also, you know, there will be a paradigm shift happening because right now we're still trying to you know, optimize quantum systems, trying to achieve the highest state fidelities. But we all know that, for instance, also crosstalk is like very much dependent on the sequence that you're running. So we're actually shifting from looking at achieving the highest fidelities for, you know, in all gates to achieving the highest fidelity for executing specific circuits and specific sequences. Yeah, so but how do we calibrate and optimize these complex quantum circuits? And including their structure, but also you, of course, want to be able to optimize the pulse parameters. So and this is where DGX Quantum comes in. 
So um, it's a very amazing system because now we're getting you know, the GPU C CPU system, which allows us to explore a huge parameter space and bring in techniques like machine learning, deep reinforcement, and learning. And then on the other hand, you have the OPX controller, which is known for being able to, in a very fast and adaptive manner, do pulse parameter updates at no additional cost. Because once your quantum program is running, you don't need to recompile it. So you have the capability in, um, to, to update um, the qubit, qubit parameters as you go. So, but let's look at a specific example. So um, how would reinforcement learning look with this architecture? So in reinforcement learning um, scheme, you have an agent, which in this case is the grasshopper, and then you have an environment, which is the OPX system and the QPU. And the agent would start with sending specific actions. So these could be you know, specific pulse parameters to the OPX, which in turn sends a sequence with these parameters um, to the QPU. Um, you basically perform your quantum operation, then you do readout and you define a reward, which for instance could be a fidelity, and that gets sent back to the agent um, um, with the observation um, where then the learning happens. And at some point, you know, you get a new set of parameters, so you go basically back and forth in a loop. So the first thing, or one of the first things that we did with this setup um, was actually at the Israeli um, Quantum Computing Center, utilizing um, also a Rigetti chip, the Rigetta Novera. And we started out you know, um, with just looking at a single qubit and do 1D optimization. And what you can see on the graph over here is we wanted to optimize the um, pi pulse amplitude. And in the beginning, these reinforcement learning agents, you know, they explore a huge parameter space. And then at a certain point after you accumulated you know, many experiments, the learning starts. And then you can see actually after you know, 180 iterations that you converge. So you converge basically to an optimal high amplitude. So this was already a great first experiment where we really showed that it's very easy to basically push actions from the GPU, CPU system to the OPX, to the QPU and back and go in this loop. Um, and then, of course, we wanted to extend to more parameters. So here we, we added then the frequency and also had like um, a convergence of, of both parameters within a few hundred iterations. Okay, but what I mentioned earlier is we actually want to move away from, you know, single qubit um, and optimizing those fidelities to actually looking at how we can optimize specific circuits and sequences. So the next thing that we did is we actually wanted to have the GHC state preparation as another example. And this is also, I think, one of the first examples where we can see we have a specific quantum job and task, which is you know, preparing the state, but interlacing it with a machine learning algorithm that can constantly calibrate and make calibrate the pulse parameters and make sure you're staying at a high fidelity. And what we're doing here is we're parametrizing the individual um, um, pulse parameters. Um, so in this case, you see we have a few single and two qubit gates, and we actually um, want to optimize um, two amplitudes and four phases in the circuit. And then, of course, you need like a reward, right? And of course, you need to be smart on how, you know, what you use as a reward. And in this case, actually, for this circuit, um, one can you know, estimate the fidelity based on this equation. And in order to get this result, one only needs to take a few Pauli measurements. Um, and then we can do some post-processing and get the fidelity value from the, um, on the hardware. And then that value gets sent back. So here I'm just showing the training lookup again. Now we send six actions, which are these two amplitudes and phases. Um, execute the GHC circuit with these updated parameters and then send back the fidelity estimate um, and the Pauli observables um, to the agent and go through this loop and um, back and forth. And I want to emphasize again why this works so nicely and it's because when you have a parametrized circuit representation, um, it maps extremely nicely to the OPX hardware and how we actually do signal generation and readout and pulse processing. Because with the OPX using QA, you anyway already you know, parametrize um, your, your pulses. And that's why this mapping you know, works very well. It's very easy without needing to do recompilation to really update the amplitudes or change the phase. 
Um, yes, and then these are our results. Of course, we wanted to compare with the baseline. So in this case, baseline refers to an offline calibration that you do once, and then you always, you know, add, um, interlace this um, with your optimized, um, optimized circuit. So, and you see with the baseline in white, after some time, the fidelity actually starts dropping, and this is because of the drifts in your system. But on the other hand, if we look at the optimized um, curve that uses this reinforcement learning cycle, you see that after the initial um, learning phase, which happens basically, um, or exploration phase, which happens in the first 100 iterations, it nicely converges to like a higher value and stays high. And we can also look now at the individual parameters. So here, here you see again how, how the individual parameters um, converge. Um, and um, after only basically um, a few seconds of learning, and they consistently stay high. Um, and of course, also if we look at the projection, we really you know, see, see um, the state preparation, what we expect from a GHC state. All right, and like lastly, I want to you know, circle back again to you know, quantum error correction. Um, and so BGX quantum, of course, was like built basically with the quantum error correction in mind and facilitating and having a system that meets the requirements that we need for tolerance. And so calibration is just like one example of what it allows you to do. But of course, we're also looking very much forward to, to optimize the system. And right now, we're very, working very hard to, to achieve this, this great code alignment between a code base alignment between NVIDIA and quantum machines to enable decoding and also utilize all of these decoders that NVIDIA actually already built. Um, yeah, so it's about really have this nice interface on software as well between CUDA Q and quantum machines, QA, um, and um, quantum control libraries. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm happy to take your questions or find me and my team later um, at the booth that we have here. Thank you. Thanks.